my hair is not agreeing with what I'm trying to do today. I have kind of thick hair, so it does this thing where sometimes it just straight up rejects bobby pins and they turn into projectiles that fly across the bathroom. Does anybody else have that? The zit on my nose, it's now past the point where it's under the skin, but now I have a scab on my nose, so maybe I popped it. I'm not saying I didn't pick at it. You're not supposed to do that, I know. Gosh, so hi. <laughs> my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. We are continuing our discussion of Angela's ashes and apparently of my current state of my skin. And yes, I'm continuing to have problems thinking about what's the best way and the right way to talk about a piece of literature like this that's a memoir that's true, but is also literary, but is also like really, really sad. I cried, I cried a lot over the ending, but I do have a few things that I did wanna talk about for this section of the book, and that will be the end of our conversation about Angela's Ashes. So I'm a little bit disappointed with how this novel has gone, or the story has gone, and the content that I've made out of it. Maybe I'll feel better about it after I edit it and it won't be so bad. But I think it's also a really good representation of like, not all of my reading weeks are like stellar weeks where I feel really excited about the concepts that I'm able to kind of pull out of a book and the way in which I'm able to analyze literature. Not, not all of them are gonna be red letter days. Some of them are gonna be average days. And so maybe, maybe that's encouraging as well to see me struggling with a book because I am struggling with this one. One thing that we see with Frank McCourt as he is coming into the, you know, this part of the book is really covering his sort of like teenage years, his young adult years, as he's growing into manhood and he's getting ready to leave the family home. And we see his developing sexuality with that. So um, his experiences kind of going through puberty, his experiences with girls, uh, it becomes a key feature of this part of the story. And that also affects his relationship with his faith. To to what extent he feels guilty, responsible, sort of incapable of dealing with these natural impulses that he has that we all go through, you know, when we're going through puberty, that fun, fun age. And so that becomes a core component of what he's going through right now. In addition to that, his family has finally gotten to the point where they're so poor, they haven't been able to pay rent on the home that they had been living in up until this point. They're too poor to be able to buy coal, to be able to buy turf. And so they actually start ripping out some of the paneling in one of the walls in their house to actually have something to burn for a fire to cook with and to keep warm. And this ultimately gets them kicked out of the place that they're renting and they have to move in with into this like tiny one bedroom little place that is a cousin. I'm not exactly sure how the relationships work, but it's either, a, it must be, but it's somebody who's related to them, can't be a blood relationship, but it's someone that her mother knows and sort of arranges for them to be put up with. And I know that that's not a blood relationship because then his mom sort of starts a romantic sexual relationship with this person as well, which is all happening at the same time that um, Frank McCourt is developing his own sexuality. And this of course creates tensions and power and authority between these two men in the household. So Frank ultimately leaves and um, goes and stays with his uncle Pa until he can get his own job. We see uh, repeated again the indignity of being poor and this pastime that I was reading about their poverty, their lack of power, their inability, you know, it's just so, so hard to get your neck above water when you live in such desperately poor circumstances. And it reminded me of a um, TED talk that I saw a long time ago. I'll try to find the link and link it down below if I'm able to. And it was of a sociologist who had sort of looked at people of similar strata of wealth across all continents and in multiple countries. And what she found was that people sort of at the lowest level, their housing and culture was actually very, very similar, like separated by 
continents and countries and all of the language barriers, like whatever. Like, but the fact that they had like a common level of wealth meant that their housing looked really similar. The, the you know, the the low, the poorest of the poor would often live in what would essentially be mud or adobe or maybe straw huts. They would be single room. The kitchen would be, you know, a fire pit or a kiln type of situation that would be outside the home. Then if you got to the next level of wealth, then you might get corrugated metal roofing and the kitchen would move into the home. You might get a stable type area where you would have a pig or a cow or a single sort of a goat, maybe just one animal of livestock, maybe a couple chickens. And then the next level is you'd have a two-room house where you'd have like your living space and your sleeping space kind of separated and on and on and on. And so the most extremely wealthy, whether you were in America or in China or in Korea or, you know, in South America or whatever, the type of palatial multi-bedroom houses, multi-bathroom houses, and even the style in which the houses were constructed would look really, really similar. And so it's amazing how equalizing you know, in the same way that it's actually quite un, un, unequalizing. But like, if you have the same sort of so economic resources, how sociologically your life really is framed out in a similar way, the things that you can afford are quite similar. And the way that we aspire our wealth and build it up across the strata is very, very similar as well. So, so interesting. And the way in which Francis wants to obviously escape his poverty and do the best that he can. He's seen the destructiveness of alcoholism on his family, so he's not gonna go down that route, but he's absolutely desperate to go to America, is that there's the only way that he's able to really do this. Well, one, he does have a job, so he has a job delivering telegrams, and then he has a job later delivering uh, magazines. But he also, on the side, takes another job where he writes threatening letters to people who have basically gotten clothing and they're on a, like a payment plan. And maybe they're behind on their payments or they never made their payments or whatever. So he writes threatening letters to basically collect on those sums of money that are outstanding. And of course, the people who can't afford to buy clothes who have to do it on a payment plan are the poorest of the poor. And those people are his neighbors. So it's like he knows all of these people that he's sort of clandestinely, nobody knows that he's working for this lady who has this business. And so he's clandestinely behind the scenes writing these letters and delivering them and he's getting money from that as well and he gets like an extra bonus if the letter is threatening enough that they pay and so there's a way in which you know he's we have that division of identity again that division of cultural culture and that split self in the same way that he recognized it in his father who had his loyalties both to ireland but also to alcohol but also to his family but also to himself and which of these loyalties was going to kind of reign the day and be how he defined himself as a human being in his embodiment and his actions and the same thing becomes true for Frank McCourt he has to make these same decisions what are you going to prioritize and the ultimate decision for this is like as he is sort of getting ready to leave Ireland and he's getting on the boat that's going to America he's sort of like thinking about well what would it have looked like if I had kept my job delivering telegrams and I had become instead of just, you know, a short term worker as a teenager, but had also like passed the exam and become like a full postal worker with, you know, all of the benefits and, you know, a retirement package, you know, pension, that's, that's the term pension and all of that, like steady job in Ireland, married an Irish girl, took care of my mom, took care of my brothers. What would that have looked like? And you can kind of see this, you know, these split past before him, but it's also a split identity that are, that are before him. What sort of person he could choose to put into reality, you know, at, at this age of like being, you know, in the like 12 to 18, these are your years of potentiality. These are your, you know, your Peter Pan years where you're these, you're this pluripotent sort of individual. And it's like, are you going to go left or are you going to go right? And over and over again, we see that male figures in his life see his potential and say, oh, and try to guide him in this, in this one direction or another. And certain doors do get closed in his face because of he comes from poverty, his father's from the north of England, you know, all of those same societal 
prejudices that we've talked about in previous episodes start to close off those options for him. But even still, there's still that question of autonomy. Are you going to keep your job here? Are you going to go to get this other job? Are you going to write the threatening letters? Or are you going to be the friend of the poor? You know, it's, um, it continues to put, you know, life puts pressure on us to be formed and fused into the one individual that we both through circumstances and our choices end up becoming. And welcome to adulthood. So that is my analysis of the final quarter of the book. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Tomorrow we are going to be doing a piece of mythology. Now I haven't exactly chosen which one, so it's going to be a surprise. I really enjoyed the way that you guys participated and voted on this material. I will have the polls up on Instagram and on Twitter on Monday. So if you want to participate next week and pick out what I do for the following Friday, you can vote there. I am at a lovely jaunt everywhere. The poll on my Instagram stories is obviously up for 24 hours because that's how Instagram stories works. But the poll that I put on Twitter will be up through the Thursday of each week. So you'll have more opportunities or a longer opportunity to vote. You'll basically be able to see it all week there. And yeah, so I actually like figured out how to do this. You're welcome. So um, same three options. Do you want me to talk about a fairy tale? Do you want me to talk about a Sherlock Holmes short story? Or would you like me to do a piece of mythology? Though that will be up for the next week as well. Until tomorrow, though, when we actually talk about a piece of mythology, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile. <laughs>